guys, we've had a great day and enjoyed the family flag making. Up next we've got some worship and then after that we're going to hear from Scott in our first encounter in the series Jesus Meets. Then later on, just to let you know, keep an eye on social media because you'll find the personal devotional questions there. Hi there everybody, it's great that you could join us. I just wanted to say before we start our service this evening and just before we start our services through the week, um, I wanted to encourage you to throw out your inhibitions and just get stuck into worship this week. Camp's going to be different this year and we're all totally gutted about that but we know that God can move in marvellous and wonderful ways that we can't even imagine and we're already looking forward to camp next year and what that'll be. But for this year and for the music that we're going to enjoy and the worship that we're going to have together and for the word that Scott's going to bring to us, I want to pray just now for that and I want to encourage you that whether that's a quieter song that you are just listening to or closing your eyes or singing or whether it's a slightly more upbeat song where there might be some dancing and I would encourage you to get in with that. I would encourage you to grab your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, your mums and dads, whoever's in your household, get them together, get up out of your couch, move that body and just praise God. So let me pray for us just now and we'll start our week of worship together. Lord, I want to thank you for Maranatha Camp. I want to thank you for the 56 years that we've had of that camp and all the different people that experienced that. I want to thank you that you've moved in mighty and wondrous ways, Lord, over all of those years. I want to pray for this year, 2020, for such an unusual year, Lord. I want to pray that you would reach out and you would touch the hearts and minds of all who are here as part of camp, Lord, both leaders and campers and parents and families that are involved as well, Lord. I want to pray that you would reach through that television screen and you would just demonstrate your love, demonstrate your kindness, your hope, your passion, Lord, for us as humans, for us as your children and your creation, Lord. We truly believe that you are the Son of God and we truly believe that you are King above all kings, that there is one God, one God only, Lord. So I pray just now as we sing about you, as we sing of you, as we raise praise towards you, Lord, and to your name, because of who you are and what you mean to us in our lives, that you would be with us and you would bless us with your presence, Lord. And I pray that throughout this week, you would teach us and you would grow us in our faith, Lord. And I want to thank you that you love every single one of us, Lord. You know every hair we have in our head. That's how much you care for us, Lord. And I really pray, Lord, that you would be with us tonight. We give all this to you in your name, to your glory, Jesus. Amen.
is in His blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, His kingdom come.
Camp. I hope that you're doing really well. Uh, my name's Scott and I live in Edinburgh and I work for a church here in the city and I was with you guys at Maranatha Camp a whole year ago and it is so strange to think that this is the time of year when we would normally be together. If we've not met one another then let me say hello. If we have met one another last year then let me say hello again. I'm really really disappointed not to be with you guys at Twitoff Park but it's great that we're able to do a lot of this online. Let's just pretend that everybody is injured after a white game. Let's just pretend that we're being assaulted by midges. And I'm sure that we'll have a lot of fun over the week to come. It's a, a strange situation that we're all in, isn't it? If the past few months for you have been anything like the past few months for me, then I imagine lockdown has been quite a tough time for you, for us. I reckon most of us will have really missed something that we've not been able to do during lockdown. Whether that's seeing friends or seeing family, sports, cinema, Nando's, whatever it may be, we're really, really looking forward to the end when everything is open again and we can see one another without any restrictions. And one of the hardest things for me that has happened is that a lot of weddings that I should have been invited to have had to be cancelled. There were a few friends of mine who were supposed to be getting married in April or in May, but unfortunately they've had to call off their wedding celebrations. It's been really hard for them, it's been really tough for them, and some of you guys might know couples that are in exactly the same situation. Some of them have had to move it to much later in the year. Some have had to postpone their wedding date and don't yet know when it's going to take place. And they found that really, really hard. And you can imagine why. There's so much to look forward to on a wedding day. They would have spent the day with family and friends. They would finally become husband and wife. And they would be looking forward to the rest of their lives together. And what a shame it is to have to cancel that day or postpone that day. And there was another wedding that was at the point of being cancelled, which took place 2000 years ago. This wedding wasn't under threat because of lockdown, but was under threat because of something else altogether. And each day at Maranatha Camp, we're going to take a short look at the Bible together. This is something that we would normally do every single year. I promise I'll keep things brief because I know what it's like to stare at a screen for too long. But every Christian believes that every time we read the Bible, we hear God speaking to us. We learn more about who he is. We learn more about what he is like. We learn more about what he thinks of us. And this year, we're going to be looking at different parts of John's gospel. This is the eyewitness account of Jesus' life written by one of Jesus' closest friends and followers, unsurprisingly named John. John was there at the time. He saw all of this with his own eyes. And that is really important for us because it means that what we read, we can trust. What he writes down for us to read thousands of years later is not just a nice idea. It's not just a bunch of nice stories. It's real, reliable history. And in chapter two of John's gospel, which we're going to be looking at this evening, 
John tells us about a time when a wedding that he was invited to was about to be cancelled. But then Jesus steps in and does something that nobody else could do in order to save the wedding. Let's look at that together now. I'm going to read it for us. If you do have a Bible and you'd like to read along with me, which would be great, then it's John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. So feel free to look that up. Uh, The words will appear on the screen as they've just done there. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. And nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants knew who had drawn the water. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink but you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Canaan of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. So 2000 years ago, we see a man named Jesus who had gone with his mother and his closest friends to a wedding. And let me tell you, in Jewish culture, they really, really knew how to throw a wedding So 2,000 years ago, the celebrations would sometimes last about a week. The groom, the husband, he was responsible for making sure the wedding went ahead and making sure that everything was okay. It was his big chance to show the parents of his new wife that he could really, really look after her and he could really take care of his responsibilities as a husband. But then there's a problem. In verse 3, we read that Jesus' mother says to Jesus, they have no more wine. And not having enough wine to last the full length of the celebrations would have been really, really embarrassing for this groom. I remember once when I was much younger helping out at our wedding. I was helping to take the food from the kitchen to the tables during the meal at a wedding. It wasn't anything especially complicated. Even I can do something like that. But the caterer had really, really underestimated how many people were going to be there and did not have enough food for everyone. And let me tell you, it was really, really embarrassing for me as somebody just helping out, never mind the families involved in organizing the wedding. Whatever food we had had to be spread out so much that to be honest with you, nobody really had all that much to eat. And this would have been a similar scenario here in John's gospel. The groom, the husband, would have had to call the rest of the celebrations off. He would have completely botched his opportunity to show his mother and father-in-law that he can take care of his new wife. After all, if he can't look after the wedding guests for a week, how is he supposed to look after his new wife for the rest of her life? This is probably about as big an embarrassment, as big a cultural disaster as you can possibly imagine. People would have been talking about this for weeks, months, possibly even longer. And so Jesus' mother steps in and says to Jesus, they have no more wine. And Jesus' response is a bit confusing. Look with me in verse four. He says, women, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Incidentally, that word woman he uses here isn't as strong as it might come across in the English. It's a much softer, gentler, more affectionate word in Jesus' own language, Aramaic. But what's all this about his hour not yet coming? 
Well, Jesus is talking about the time. Jesus is talking about the hour where everyone sees and understands exactly why he came to the earth. Jesus is talking about his very purpose for being born. He's talking about his death on the cross. And Jesus says to his mother, this isn't supposed to be the moment where everyone sees who I am and why I came. But Jesus is also kind and compassionate enough to step in and save the wedding. So look at verse seven there. Oops. Look at verse seven there. Jesus says to the servants, the people like me who would have been there to help cater at the wedding, to fill some jars and then draw some out and take some to the master of the banquet. And miraculously, what comes out is not water, but wine. And look at the master's response in verse 10. That's better. There we go. The master of the banquet's response is, you have saved the best wine until now. The master of the ceremony says that this wine is good, really good. But not only that, there is so much of it. The amount of wine produced here would have been enough to fill we reckon just under 1,000 bottles of wine. It's good, and there is a lot of it. The groom's embarrassment has been spared, and the wedding has been rescued. And as I finish up, John says right at the end of the section that we saw this morning, this evening, in verse 11, John says that this miracle points to something else. See, John says that this miracle, this thing that's just happened, reveals Jesus' glory. And his disciples who saw this believed in him. What does that mean? Well, the whole way through the Old Testament, the section that comes before the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, the part of the Bible before Jesus walked on the earth, the whole way through the Old Testament, God's people need a rescuer. They needed rescue from the times when they had rejected God. They needed rescue from their sins, just like we do. And every time that rescue is promised by God, it's always described in the most exciting ways. God's rescue for his people is described as a feast with people from all over the world enjoying rich foods, and enjoying the best wine. So do you see what Jesus is doing here? God's people have been promised rescue. It's been described as a feast with rich, tasty wine. And that is exactly what Jesus provides here at this wedding. He's saying the rescue for God's people has begun. It's here, and Jesus is the one that's going to make it happen. This miracle, turning water into wine, is a signpost. Jesus is producing the best wine that has been promised for God's people for a long, long time. And it means that he is the one who has come to rescue them from sin and death. He is everything that the Old Testament promises. He is the beginning of the rescue plan. Now that is great news for anyone who trusts in Jesus. See, we might think that eternity with God is, well, going to be a bit boring. We might think that God ruins our fun. He comes along with uh, a bunch of rules. And if anything, in this story, you would expect Jesus to take the wine and turn it into water. But that's not what happens here. See, Jesus is showing that a relationship with him, being saved by him, following him, means being with him forever and enjoying everything that he gives us. And what he gives us is the best, and there is lots of it. If you think this wine is good, 
master of a banquet. Just wait until you taste the wine that Jesus will give us when he returns to take us to a new creation. And so what we'll see over the next few days, what we'll see over the rest of the week is more and more evidence that Jesus really is the rescuer. He really, really is the Messiah. He really is the son of God. And that by believing in him, as we see his glory and understand who he is and believe in him, we will have eternal life. Not boring, stuffy, eternal life, but just as we've seen today, the best eternal life we could ever imagine given to us by Jesus. Let me pray for us as we finish. Father, thank you for the time that we've had to look at uh, John's gospel. Thank you for the way that we can understand more and more about who Jesus is as we read these words. And we pray, Father, that you'll help us to realise and remember that Jesus comes to rescue us and to give us the best eternal life that we could possibly ever imagine or ask for. Father, for those of us who know you, thank you that this is our reality. Please encourage us every single day to trust in Jesus, to trust that he is good and kind and compassionate. And for those of us, Father, who don't yet know you, who don't yet follow Jesus, we pray that you would help us over the course of the week to understand more and more how good it is to know you, how good it is to be forgiven by you, and to understand the wonderful promise of eternal life that awaits every single one of us who trusts in you. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. There's not a prison while he can't break through.
Jesus' name that makes your way. 